amazing job. It's been seamless for us from the time that we picked, up a, picked this up in Delhi. I'm a little bit nervous, actually, because you are the people, unfortunately, that are going to have to fix the mess that's been created for the last few hundred years, a few thousand years even in some cases. So I'm a bit wary about talking to you because you've got some big challenges ahead. Oh, you can, you can handle it. I'll show you a few of the challenges. We saw some this morning. I'm going to go into a few more now. Um, I deal with the geopolitical, strategic, and security implications of environmental change. You don't have to tell a farmer or a fisherman why environmental change is a bad thing, but for some reason you need to tell politicians and people in defense and strategic areas why it's a bad thing. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit of the sort of discussions that we're starting to have in those communities. First, I'm going to talk terminology. Why am I using the term environmental change, not climate change? Then we're going to look at the challenges for physical infrastructure. In particular, energy infrastructure, because energy infrastructure underlies much of what we consider to be uh, developed in the developing world. You unplug New York and you have a very serious problem. And the challenges for legal infrastructure. We sort of assume that the legal system floats above the universe, guiding our, our stability. But our legal infrastructure is very much based on the physical realities. And as it becomes disconnected, we start to get very exciting new problems. And we're going to look at the law of the sea, and that affects India in particular in its relationship with the Maldives. So, why environmental change, not climate change, and where is the problem? This is an image that you would expect to see uh, maybe in a place like Bangladesh, unfortunately, which gets hit by a lot of floods. This is New Orleans, which essentially became a war zone. Nobody is immune to these sorts of problems. And the reason is, when you, and as a lot of engineers know, when you design something, you design based on what's already there, and then you build on top of it. So these are four examples of defensive fortifications from around the world. You've got Scotland, France, Israel, and here in India. And they look pretty much the same, because they're built in more or less the same sorts of locations for more or less the same reasons. You're high up on a hill, overlooking a plain, difficult to attack, to pour boiling oil on your enemies. But they all make one assumption, which is that there will be a fresh water supply in the fort. There's no fresh water supply. If you get an environmental change, they become defensive, go from defensive fortifications to death traps. And essentially, we have done the same thing. We have designed assuming that the environment won't change. But it's changing, and you can see it. These are all examples from the West. There's a landslide that took out part of a subdivision in California. Subsidence, uh, which is when the ground gives way, that ate a house in New Zealand. A railway that's now going right into the sea in France. And flooding that took out an electrical substation in the UK. Our environment is changing quite dramatically, and we have not designed for it. This isn't all just climate change. A lot of places we know are vulnerable. When the hurricane hit New Orleans, it wasn't a Category 5, it was a Category 3. It's a relatively medium-sized to small hurricane in a hurricane zone. This is a map of the Gulf Coast of the U.S. Every single red line is a hurricane that hit that coast in the last 150 years. Not a surprise that a hurricane would hit an area that's in a hurricane zone. But so why was there so much damage this time? We made a lot of mistakes. We put in bad levees. They were inappropriately designed. There was a lack of town planning, building on floodplains. Uh, there was large-scale subsidence all over the city. Uh, and that was caused by draining wetlands, extraction of groundwater, and inappropriately designed waterways. They moved rivers. You can stop all climate change, but if you're still doing these sorts of things, you still have a very serious problem. And we're doing these sorts of things all over. So it's important to remember when you're looking at from a security perspective, trying to create more stability, that the challenge includes, but it's not limited to climate change, and it's global. I'll show you how that plays out a little bit in energy infrastructure. I'm from Canada. Uh, Canada is seeing warmer winters, which is supposed to be a good thing. But what that means is that we're getting more freezing rain 
freezing rain is the rain falls as water, liquid water. It hits power lines and trees and freezes solid. And then the weight builds up and builds up and builds up. And eventually you can end up with this, which is a totally destroyed electricity pylon. We had this happen in 1998, knocked out power to about 6 million people in the middle of winter, in some cases for weeks. We're starting to see more of these sorts of disruptions. And because of the globalized nature of the energy system, if one part of it goes down, there are knock-on effects in other parts. If, if you can't get hydro supply, you're going to be looking to buy more oil and gas. That can affect global prices. And we saw that after Katrina. This is again the Gulf Coast. Uh, the little yellow dots are offshore oil and gas platforms. The black dots are onshore support facilities like refineries. The two red lines are the tracks of hurricanes Rita and Katrina as they went through the Gulf Coast in the summer of 2005. They did some damage. This is an offshore platform jammed under a rig. Sorry, an offshore platform jammed under a bridge after Katrina. It damaged hundreds of pipelines. It destroyed 113 platforms. It totally wiped out production in uh, kind of a very critical time of the year, and as a result created a spike in global oil prices. Katrina affected the Indian government very directly because of the way oil and gas is subsidized here. These knock-on economic effects are becoming more frequent, and it was supposed to be a one-off. Bad summer, summer of 2008, Ike and Gustav went through the area and shut down production again. Starting to see this more and more frequently. We see it in low-lying installations as well. This is uh, many, Saudi Arabia, Rotterdam, any of those critical pieces of infrastructure, basically at sea level. This is uh, Jamnagar refinery here in India, one of the largest in Asia, was knocked out by flooding in 2007. These coastal installations are very vulnerable to sea level rise, flooding, storm surges. Hydro, this is another problem here in India. Um, you build a hydro dam, you look at the last 50 to 100 years of precipitation patterns, glacial melt, those sorts of things, and you plan for that. But the last 50 100 years tell us nothing about the next 5 to 10 years. And as a result, you're starting to see some pretty major disruptions. In India, in 2008, hydro generation was down over 8%. In 2009, it was down 12%. This is a very dynamic, growing economy that can't afford to lose that much energy coming from one of the major sources. It affects development and it affects the way you interact with oil and gas partners as well. Nuclear is supposed to be uh, one of the ways forward, but a nuclear power station takes an enormous amount of water for cooling. So that means it's either built on the coast, like this one, this is Terraport, built right on the coast, which means it's subject to sea level rise, storm surges, changing coastal geomorphology, or it's built on a river. Built on a river. The river water is supposed to come in the plant and be discharged back into the river. With increased temperatures, the river water itself is already warmer. The plant is running warmer. Demand is increasing. And the temperature at which you can discharge the water is fixed. So your cooling capacity in the water, the water, is limited. And that has already created a lot of problems in Europe. Uh, where they have a lot of river-based plants. In the summer of 2003, France had to shut down or power off 17 nuclear reactors. It took them, cost about 300 million euro to make up the supply. In 2006, France, Spain, and Germany had to power down because of heat problems. And in 2009, France had to power down a third of its plants and buy power from the UK, which the French was extremely native. Renewables, are a very important way forward, but we have to be, place them in the right location. They're not immune from these sorts of problems. So if you build a solar array, but you build it in a floodplain, you're not much further ahead. So this is a solar powered factory in the US. You can't see the solar panels because they're underwater. They were hit by a flood and it knocked out that power system. So the point is here, we're entering a period in which limiting loss will be as important as promoting growth. And to limit loss, you need to use your imagination to think about what some of the challenges will be coming down the pike and not just looking at the past. It'll take the sort of imagination that you guys have 
And as we talked about in one of the previous presentations about connecting the dots, the dots are there. You just need to start looking for them when you're doing your planning. Right now it's not being done. This is going to take you. Legal infrastructure, the same way our physical infrastructure is built right onto our environment, in many ways our legal infrastructure also is built right onto our environment. And as our environment changes, our legal infrastructure is becoming disconnected. And you can see it really clearly in the Law of the Sea. The Law of the Sea is an international agreement. Everybody has signed it except the US, of course, but they probably will sign at some point. And uh, the basic premise is, if you have a coastline, you get a 200 mile exclusive economic zone off your coastline. That makes one very big assumption, that the coastline is not Well, what happens if your coastline retreats by 100 miles? Does the exclusive economic zone retreat as well? The very serious issue for countries like Bangladesh, for example, which uh, this is a, a UN map, and you can see they're anticipating with a 1.5 meter sea level rise a massive retreat of the Bangladesh coastline. This is an acknowledged problem and they're trying to work it out on a one-off basis. But we can't patch up regulations bit by bit by bit. It just won't. And it's already starting to get very messy. I'll show you a US case. This is a, another piece of the law. An offshore island can deviate your border. In the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico has been using an offshore island to anchor a very large hydrocarbon claim uh, based around that island. The U.S. said, fine, show us the island. So the Mexican military sent out their planes to find this island, and it wasn't there anymore. So Mexico said, well, you know, obviously the CIA blew up the island, trying to get rid of our claim. And the U.S. said, you know what, no island, no claim. If the law of the future is going to be no island, no claim, as sea levels rise and eat little islands all around the world, we're going to have some very tricky situations. And you can see it in the South China Sea. Um, the overlapping squares and different shaped dots, they represent uh, up to six countries claiming little islands in the South China Sea. That South China Sea is full of hydrocarbons, oil and gas. It's already led to skirmishes Vietnam and China, it's a very uh, hot area at the moment. This is uh, pretty typical for the area. This is a Chinese military base in the South China Sea. You can see the two very unfortunate young men who I hope know how to swim. Uh, they are national heroes. They're anchoring potentially billions of dollars worth of oil and gas claims. But a little bit of sea level rise and their rock disappears. If it's no island, no claim, you get into a whole new, very messy situation. You know that in this region, through the Maldives, there's a lot of talk from the president of the Maldives, who's a very smart, empathetic uh, guy, saying, you know, we're going to have to move our population. Well, and, and this, is, this gives you an idea of how low-lying these islands are. It will not take a lot of sea level to change uh, course of evacuation. So if there's an evacuation, if the islands disappear, do they cease to exist as a country? Do they lose their seat in the UN? Do the waters become international waters? The serious security situation for India, this is, the Maldives are kind of the bit down at the bottom. Um, it's it's uh, the entrance into the Indian Ocean. Uh, the, the area just below it, the round crosshatched area, that's a, a U.S. military base that's used for monitoring the area. The question is, what happens? You know, could India, for example, take in that population, Maldivian population, and extend the Indian exclusive economic zone to include Maldivian waters, and use the revenue from the licensing of fisheries and those sorts of things to pay for the resettlement of the Maldivians? These questions aren't really being asked. Right but they're the sort of uh, problems we definitely will face and will take imagination to solve. I use the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea as, a, as an example of disconnect between the law and the environment, but there are a lot more. And you know that here. Water shared agreements, for example, are a whole other area that's going to have problems. Uh, you know that with India-China, with the Himalayas, and of course India-Pakistan, which is heating up now. Fishery sharing agreements, hydropower sharing agreements, 
those sorts of insurance, like flood insurance is going to have problems, agricultural subsidies are a mess. All of these pieces of legislation, which you think of as floating above an environmental reality, are actually very interlinked to an environmental reality. And as the environmental reality changes, that superstructure becomes unstable. There's more, lots, lots more, unfortunately. Failure of legal infrastructure can be as problematic as a failure of physical infrastructure, and all the more tragic because it's totally unnecessary. It's just a failure of imagination. So, where does this leave us? In order to truly understand the geopolitical and geoeconomic, we have to understand the geopolitical. No longer enough just to assess our impact on the environment. We must now also plan for a changing environment's impact on us. This is a time for solutions, and we heard a lot of great suggestions this morning. For example, be creative, marry arts and science, as we heard this morning. Let your blood run green. Ask the questions that need asking, and act on those answers. Don't stand under rickety ladders is probably the most important one I heard, concrete suggestion this morning. And use great ideas wherever you find them, but always say thank you.